the show, did you know I'm coming to Massachusetts, Charlotte, two stops in Germany, France, Budapest, Armenia, Russia, Tampa, Florida, Houston, Texas, Montana, Redding, California, Minnesota, and Hawaii with a new mission trip to Kashmir and Nepal? Find it all at thenewmystics.com slash schools and get more details on everything at the end of this video. Hi, I'm John Crowder, and for about a decade, I have launched an attack against a popular charismatic term, getting hungry for God. It is the mantra you hear at every conference or revival. We've got to get hungry. Was Jesus not a good enough meal? We've got to get thirsty. Didn't he say if you drink of these waters, you'll never thirst again? We need more of the Lord. Uh, what are you waiting on? God's second begotten son, Ralph. Didn't Jesus say you now have the fullness of the Godhead effortlessly, thanks to your union with him? Yes, there is a more Lord, but it's not more of something you don't have. It is more of a discovery of the fullness that's already in your belly. Now, I'm not saying that if you're currently bored with your experience in God, well, too bad, that's all there is. No, I'm saying if you're bored, it's not that you're lacking something more, Lord. No, you're just sniffing the cork of the infinite wonder that he's already put in your belly. There's a lifelong discovery, an eternal discovery, but you've got it all thanks to Jesus. Now, I know that attacking this hunger language is a sacred cow. I've heard leaders say so self-righteously, no one can take away my hunger for the Lord. But language is important. And see, this is much, much more than mere semantics. We're dealing with a fundamental paradigm of a finished work, victorious gospel versus a humanistic message of incompletion. Better language instead of hunger is this. Um, enjoy the Lord. Feast on the Lord. Discover more of the Lord. Explore the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. But talk of hunger indicates a current position of lack, an unfinished business. We don't pray for world hunger in the natural, do we? It also tends toward an inward straining to achieve something Christ hasn't given you, which is all a fruit of doubt. And somehow, charismatic leaders think that by cultivating doubt in Christ's work, it will ultimately result in satisfaction in Christ's work? That is just nonsense. The flavor of faith is not hunger. It is satisfaction. It is resting in something he's given us. Cultivate faith by cultivating words like satisfaction, not hunger, but fulfillment. That's another good word. But you know what I'm saying, John. When I say I'm hungry for the Lord, maybe I do, but maybe not. Maybe we're on different pages here. I mean, maybe we are on different pages. Guys, what we speak and how we say it is paramount when it comes to the gospel because it can indicate an entirely different message. And hey, maybe you really are hungry for the Lord because you haven't heard or believed the gospel yet. I'm not saying you haven't claimed Jesus as your Lord. You just don't really believe that he's finished the job. Maybe you're preaching a potential gospel or a partial gospel and you're on your way. That would be the case. If your first knee-jerk reaction response to this video is to quote the words of Jesus saying, but blessed are the hungry, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yeah, well, why don't we finish reading that verse to the end? It says they will be satisfied. Satisfaction is the flavor of faith of a finished work gospel. If you're still hungry, then you're saying Christ's righteousness was not enough. And you're still pursuing a righteousness of your own. Again, words are important. You know, I used to know a very powerful speaker, such a heavy whack on this guy who taught Christ crucified as his core and only message, but eventually he started giving up little pieces of his message, bit by bit, in order to appeal to this big 
charismatic network that he was trying to court and appeal to. And he used to hate the phrase, get hungry for God. He says, why get hungry? We already have God. But hunger was such a big part of that network's language that eventually he compromised not only this bit of terminology, but more and more and more into the guys just absorbed. He's just one of the machine these days. It's sad. Now see, most guys, they don't equate this idea of spiritual hunger with a performance-based spirituality. They wouldn't call it that. Charismatics, they just think of outward works versus inward passion. So they don't see that this inward striving is also a law mentality. Seeking God was a pre-Christ action. You already have him now. Seek and you will find. As a matter of fact, he says, I found you. Okay. In fact, you always did have him. You just didn't know it. Your seeking never got you anything, really. He said, I will reveal myself to those who were not even looking for me. Okay, it's all him at the end of the day. That's the good news of the gospel. But this language, man, it keeps the machine going. If God is something you still long and yearn for, and God is a commodity that they dole out, well, it keeps them indefinitely in business. If God is a quantifiable object that you're still pursuing bit by bit rather than a person, as we see in authentic, original Nicene Christianity, I mean a person, not a force that you get bits of here and there. He comes in person, not in portions. Now, not everyone using this term spiritual hunger is totally off, okay? Again, if by it you mean that you you like God, you enjoy God, well, a ravenous appetite for God in that sense is glorious. And yes, it comes from tasting and seeing that you want to keep feasting. The feast is continual. We don't stop feasting. That's not what I'm saying. The issue of concern is this pressurized attempt to whip you up into an emotional froth of trying to generate love for God. If you're not hungry, you got to get hungry. You can't generate love for God, if that's what you're talking about. It comes from one place and one place only. We only love him because he first loved us. Huh, you mean he did that part too? Look, if you leaders want to generate a responsive love to God from the people back toward God, there's only one way to do that. And it's not by telling them how deficient and lacking they are in love or how cold their hearts are toward God. It comes by declaring God's unceasing, relentless love and grace toward them. And as they catch a whiff of that, they can't help but begin to adore him back. See, only then do we begin to marvel and find ourselves in awe of his goodness and endless compassion when the gospels preach, when what he has done and who he is is preached, not my response being preached. And my friends, this itself is the seedbed of love. Because see, if I'm just commanded to love my spouse, that does no good. My heart can't spontaneously generate feeling on command. No, it's by looking at her and reflecting on her wonder that, that love is enkindled. But we need a language of completion. I know that sounds counterproductive when you're trying to motivate your flocks to action, to tell them that everything's already done but it's still the truth, okay? Hunger or seeking after God are pre-Christian actions. You have been found, you have been filled. And even then, before you were a Christian, salvation had nothing to do with your human will, your human desire. Didn't you know this? This is Christianity 101. This was the whole underlying revelation of the Reformation. Martin Luther's number one pet peeve, what he called the idol of the human will, the idea that your human will or desire has anything whatsoever to do with salvation. Only God can give an appetite for God. Of course, we inherently want God because we're made in his image, but under the delusion of that Adamic fall, that capacity for wanting God was completely perverted and misguided. 
It's not that we love God, but that God loved us. That is the gospel. But that's not just the beginning part, the pre-knowing Jesus part. The gospel's the gospel from start to finish. I am still dependent on his love for me, not on my waning hunger for him, if that's the way you want to define it. Yes, loving God is uber important. But don't put the cart before the horse. The only way that happens is by recognizing, again, his love for me. So, this language issue. It may help if we actually use some biblical terminology because hunger implies unmet lack. Zeal, the word zeal, implies overabundance of divine energy. So sure, let's be zealous for the Lord. That's a good one. Hunger implies need. Zeal implies unleashed passion. But even here, there's a potential of a zeal without knowledge, as Paul describes of the Pharisees who were zealous to achieve a righteousness of their own because they were unaware of the gifted righteousness in Jesus Christ. So they had a zeal without knowledge. Sound familiar? So many who speak of spiritual hunger to some degree or another are actually preaching zeal without knowledge. And I would surmise that the majority of Christians today, while giving an obligatory nod to God's righteousness in theory, actually don't believe they are righteous in actuality and therefore burn themselves out on wasted religious regimens of God-pleasing exercises when they could have spent that time doing something positive out of the truth of their identity, i.e. declaring to others how scandalously God already loves and accepts and has fully united himself to everyone thanks to Jesus. I mean, they spend time trying to groan and get what they already have, trying to become who they already are, when in actuality they could rest in the truth, which seems too good for them to believe, to actually spend their time giving it away and enjoying it. Now look, in deriding so-called spiritual hunger, I am not advocating apathy. No one likes sitting in a place where people are cold and dispassionate. And it's true that apart from that first love flame and ravenous desire for the Lord, we definitely miss the fun and fruit and the unpackaging of the benefits and treasures and inheritance that's in our salvation. Okay, trust me, plenty of people have had their love grow cold and it's a nightmare. So perhaps a better biblical term than hunger is love. If I were apart from my wife, I may hunger for her, but I'm not apart from Christ. So equating hunger with love, hunger implies the pain of separation, like from your Big Mac. You're not separate from your lover, though. If you think you are, someone should preach the gospel to you. But equally disturbing is when people feel they have to work themselves up into an emotional froth all the time, banging their head against the wall in a subtle attempt to make sure their hearts are right before the Lord, as if they're going to miss out if they don't uphold their end of some elusive bargain that's already been fully struck and secured between God and man in that bilateral union of God and man in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, look, there is a non-evangelical zeal, and I mean that word in the traditional sense of unevangelized. A non-evangelical zeal, or so-called hunger, where we're trying to whip ourselves into an exhausted frenzy, which is the opposite of resting in the security of the gospel, which actually denies the glory of Christ in his finished work, because we proudly think we must add to it with our own spiritual rigor. When I'm saying toss the word hunger, I'm not saying toss Jesus. I'm not saying toss your love for Jesus. I'm not saying toss your obsession for Jesus. There's another good word, obsession, addiction, okay? So look, you've got people volunteering at church 20 hours a week, just like you wanted on their hunger quest for fulfillment, and it keeps the coffers full, doesn't it? But what have you told them? Keep the zeal, but don't do it for growth or acceptance. God loves you and wants you to spend that 20 hours taking night classes and actually making something out of your life. Then because you enjoy God, 
and aren't just trying to pay him off to accept you, once you're making six figures from that job that you're going to get after those night classes, then you can float this ministry, which is preaching the real gospel that was authentic enough to tell you the truth and didn't just keep dangling your acceptance in front of your face like a carrot so that you tied your minimum wage check. And at the end of the day, guys, look, it's just reality. Jesus did it. You think you're going to climb that hill? <laughs> At the end of the day, the cult of hunger is just inauthentic. I'm not against emotion. My God, have you seen footage of one of our meetings? Okay, but I'm not whipping myself up to get closer to God or get something out of God that I don't have. No, I'm enjoying my union with God because that's what I'm created for. And out of my participation, which is sparked, by the irresistible, unforced rhythms of grace, there is radical manifestation and kingdom living and fruit and healthy, holy living. But when we think we have anything to do with generating this stuff, we've missed the point of the gospel and we'll just end up another misguided Arminian do-it-yourself cult that tips the hat to the work of the cross but carves off sanctification and Christian growth or maturity as something you must prop up on your own from an incomplete identity rather than something you give into out of enjoyment and desire. The gospel has nothing to do with your hunger for God. It was all about his desire for you. We have enough additives and add-ons in the religious market. Yes, but what about your part? Jesus is my part. The gospel is enough. Preach a pure gospel and people will start leaning toward getting their act together from a place of identity, okay? But as soon as you tack that stuff on as a surcharge, you end up with neither the gospel nor its fruit. Just insecure people confused about themselves and God's relation to them, okay? I am obsessed with Jesus. I am addicted to Jesus, okay? But I am not lacking anything. Though I'm addicted, I'm high as a kite. Okay, and I'm not hungry because my belly is fat, satisfied. Here is John Crowder, absolutely fat, happy, and fulfilled. Over and out. Hey guys, our mission trip to Hong Kong and Philippines packed out, slam full. We had to cut off registration early, but check out this little exotic morsel we have up our sleeve. Do you feel a call to missions? Travel with us on a two-nation trip to Kashmir and Nepal as we venture to the Himalayas. Known as a region of conflict, North Indian Kashmir is also labeled the most beautiful place on earth. We'll bring the fire of the gospel. You will heal the sick, carry the glory. It's our only trip now open to applicants, and it's a joint trip with myself, John Crowder, and Matt Spinks. We'll have a grace equipping event in Kashmir, plus a mass crusade where we'll gather thousands in Nepal. We'll also have fun with a night in Kathmandu. We'll go to the lowland jungles of Nepal. You can ride elephants, take a jeep safari, see rhino. We won't make you climb Everest, but you can take the optional hike. The trip is open to all ages. We leave in March 2018, so you have plenty of time to plan, raise funds, sort out the details, but all our trips do fill up. So you do need to get your first deposit in by November 1st to lock in your spot. So take a step of faith, get your application in at thenewmystics.com slash trek. Next month, I'm in Germany in September for two back-to-back -back weekend events where you can overdose on glory. Supernatural Joy Unspeakable near Cologne and a mystical school in Hanau. I have one mystical school in America this year in Massachusetts, our only New England event. It's in October. My only other mystical school in America will be in January 2018 in Charlotte, North Carolina. Then we have just one more mystical school on the calendar. It's in France next February. Find every mystical school, conference event, and mission trip online at thenewmystics.com schools. This October, we invite you to take a journey within. Make a pilgrimage with us as we explore the kingdom of God. It's not far away in either time or space. The kingdom of God is all around us, and the kingdom is within. It is right here at hand. Paradise is now. In October, myself, John Crowder, together with Tim Wright leading worship, will travel to four regions of America, Tampa, Florida, Houston, Texas, Billings, Montana, and Redding, California, for our Paradise Now event. 
Join the adventure with us as we explore the wonder of our mystical union with God. Registration is now open and seating is limited. Visit thenewmystics.com slash tour. I'm often asked my number one recommended resource for diving into the revelation of grace, the finished work of the cross, mystical Christianity, union with God, Trinitarian theology. Well, it's our online course, Cana New Wine Seminary, intoxicating theology with world-class instructors, available at an easy pace right from your own home. Registration is now open for next fall's classes at cana.co. Take the time to pull aside, invest in your relationship, prioritize your marriage. You can book a babysitter and schedule a vacation with us. Come away from the daily stress of life and career and venture to Maui, Hawaii. We have a special getaway in Maui for couples, a marriage retreat designed for marital bliss in paradise. It's John and Lily Crowder, Rick and Melissa Wood, Far from a fix-me-up religious self-help program, this marriage retreat is a glorious detox from the fears, insecurities, identity hang-ups, and awkward communication gaps that blind us to the glory of marital joy. Have you ever heard that the honeymoon doesn't last forever? Well, religion tells us that marriage will be difficult, that it requires lots of work, and we should expect the worst, but a gospel perspective should effortlessly revolutionize our expectancies and supernaturally rekindle a ravenous desire for our spouse. This retreat is designed to deepen your relationship at every level. It's full of fun and candid discussion. We'll cover experiential, real-life topics like sex, money, parenting, and changing the way we think to improve communication skills and intimacy. And yes, you can turn a living hell into a tropical paradise, but this is not just an intervention for troubled marriages or folks with problems. It's all about growth growing in a grace perspective and delving into new realms of love. So come to Maui with us. You have plenty of time to plan. It's February 2018. However, registration will be limited for this event. So we recommend early registration. You can visit thenewmystics.com slash retreat. We're calling all Amish and Mennonites who have been excommunicated, shunned, disfellowshipped, or those who just want to be. Hitch the buggy to Minnesota for this North America Amish Holy Ghost party. Warning, there will be instruments. Tim Wright is going to do the worship. It's fun for the whole family. We are going to party like it's 1599. Everyone is welcome. Buttons and cell phones are allowed. This November, visit thenewmystics.com slash Amish. Sons of Thunder runs on partnerships and generous contributions from people like you. If you've been blessed by the ministry and want to participate in sharing the gospel and reaching the poor with us, consider becoming a monthly supporter at thenewmystics.com partners.